Spider-Man was kind of being treated as an indie almost at first with the creatives. It was Sam Raimi and Tobey Maguire. So I thought, wow, this is cool. They're gonna try and make something, you know, really interesting, meaningful. And I knew it would be life-changing. Hi, I'm Kirsten Dunst, and this is a timeline of my career. Don't make me do this, I cannot! Yet you could do it to me. Snatch me from my mother's hand, like two monsters in a fairy tale. And now you weep. You haven't tears enough for what you've done to me. You give her to me, Louis! I was uh, three years old in the grocery store, and like people would come up to my mom and be like, your kid's cute, you should put her in like child acting or modeling, and we were in New Jersey, and so I signed with the Ford Modeling Agency as a little girl. I went out for a kick cereal commercial, and I booked it, and then Interview with the Vampire came around, and that's, you know, was my big break. Which one of you did it? I guess I must have had something, a quality that probably caught up to itself eventually. But, you know, as a young girl, I probably maybe had an, a look in my eyes that, you know, a more old soul quality than most young girls, maybe. You see the old woman? That will never happen to you. I had to kind of give a look of, like, longing. You will never grow old, and you will never die. I remember working with my acting coach a lot. He kind of would make things more relatable for me. He was like, you know when you steal your brother's toy and you know where it is and he's asking asking for it? He's like, that's the look, you know, like for this. The only time I remember complaining to Neil Jordan was I had to bite this woman's neck and she was sweating, like sweating. And I was like, oh, I was like, Neil. So that was, you know, the worst thing I did. And also having, obviously, to kiss Brad Pitt at that point. I was a little girl and he was like a brother to me and it was very weird. Even though it was a peck, I just was very not into it. Other than that, I was treated like a total princess on that set, so. And it means something else too, doesn't it? She'll never ever grow up. Limes? Are limes the fashion now? Of course they are. It's nothing but limes now. Everyone keeps them in their desks and trades them for beads and things. Mm -hmm. And all the girls treat each other at recess. If you don't bring limes to school, you're nothing. You might as well be dead. I had just come from Interview with the Vampire, which was a very male set. And then to go from that to Little Women was such a fun difference for me. I was with all these older actresses that were so cool. And like I looked up to Claire Danes and Winona Ryder and Jillian Armstrong was directing. So it was, it couldn't be more polar opposite to the interview of the vampire. It was great for a young girl. Like, I, I just had the best time working with, with all of those women. Now, I want you to do all the pages that I've marked. I won't have a sister who's a lazy ignoramus. You don't sulk, you look like a pigeon. <gasps> I also remembered auditioning for Jillian Armstrong for Little Women. And I think I had to audition for Beth and Amy. I think I still had like a little interview of the vampire Claudia in me, because she was like, um, her read was like a little, like maybe like dark or something. I probably still had interview with the vampire mojo on me. You'll be sorry for this, Joe March. Somebody roll a five or an eight. He did. <laughs> Being on the set of Jumanji watching Robin Williams was so exciting for me. You know, when you're a kid, you don't appreciate things as much as when you look back as an adult. It was really special to be on that set um, with him. Just wet. I just remember being in these water tanks for weeks with like a wetsuit underneath and our all our clothes on. My mom would send me sandwiches on a raft. It was a little bit scary too. I remember standing on the steps and they'd be like, three, two, one. And there's like a gush of water that comes down these stairs and we kind of float back and it was kind of terrifying. I was 16, it was the first time I was kind of seen 
in a, a more womanly light working with Sophia. She always made me feel very beautiful for exactly all of my quirks and who, exactly who I was. Just being 16, it's just a hard time and to have an, a woman who I thought was so cool to look up to think that I'm pretty, like kind of set me up for the rest of, you know, dealing with Hollywood and dealing with like producers, directors, or critiques of myself. I was like, well, Sophia thinks I'm pretty, so I'm good. You know what I mean? Like I kind of had that like, whatever. Like I never felt like I had to look too sexy or do anything other than what was authentic to me. This was around the time we began to see Lux making love on the roof with random boys and men. What else? Will you stop? Where are you turning? What are they doing? Changing on this thing. They're rolling around up there. It was written in a script that I like have to make out with a bunch of different boys on the roof. It freaked me out. I hadn't, I was a very innocent 16 year old and finally was like, I'm kind of nervous. So if she was like, you don't need to kiss any of them. Just like bury your head in their neck and like we'll put, you know, a jacket or just like he'll put his arm around you here and stuff. So she always made it, you know, comfortable for me. In the atmosphere she created on set, it always felt very authentic. Um, which helped lend itself to the realness of, of, of the way we were all feeling during the actual scenes. Making Bring It On, I was making it at an age range of my peers who would watch this movie. It's probably like seven, 16, 17. It's age appropriate and I feel like there was some movies that I did that weren't, like pe things that I did that adults only watched. And this was like something for people my age. Gee, now I'm confused. Well, I hope you're not too busy to hear this. Kiss my ass, Aaron. It's over. What convinced me to do Bring It On was talking to Peyton Reed, the director. He's so smart, he had done a bunch of Mr. Shows, and I just knew that he was gonna take this script and like elevate it in a really fun way. And to be honest, like none of us knew that this was gonna be a huge hit. We were like having a fun summer in San Diego. That way, when we beat you, we'll know it's because we're better. I'll bring it, don't worry. You have a knack for getting in trouble. <laughs> you have a knack for saving my life. Honestly, I never think about it while I'm making it, but I just knew that, I just felt like it was special, the cast that was coming together always. It was like Willem Dafoe and Alfred Merlina, and like we always had amazing actors. You are amazing. Sam always wanted the quality, the heart and soul. That was always the most important. And the way he talked about Spider-Man and movies, he just got you excited. Like I remember when we did do the upside down kiss, he had given me a book um, of like famous kisses. Like he, Sam was so romantic about this movie. And so making it with him didn't feel like a huge movie. It felt like we were making a tiny movie on a bigger scale. Mary Jane, you kind of like, kind of know what she is when she runs out of her house, like a fight going on in her house, and she sees Peter there, and you're like, oh, Mary Jane has this whole really hard childhood that like, you just got a glimpse of. She kind of represents every girl next door, kind of, everyone has problems. She represents first love. Hello, my dear. Sam Raimi wanted me to like try out a stunt. So he took me to the top of a Sony studio, which is very, very, very high. And they just free felt, like I bungee jumped basically. I was like, you should have shot that because I'm never doing that again. I was like, that's never happening. I was terrified. We are who we choose to be. Now choose. Sophia just gave me Antonio Fraser's novel and she's like, I want you to play Marie Antoinette. And I was like, oh God, it's like a 500 page novel. I was like, I was like, cool, <laughs> thanks so. I was very nervous. I was like, do I need to get like accent coaches and all this stuff? She's like, no, no, no. We're gonna do it a different kind of approach to a period film. We shot at Versailles every Monday, which was pretty unreal. I got to see her like private bathroom. I think just crazy 
you know, to, to, to have, to dance with Jason Schwartzman in the Hall of Mirrors. We had a really good time, but I definitely always felt like uh, overwhelmed because it's an intimidating person to, to, to play, even though I feel like at the end of the day, I almost played like an essence of her in Sophia's interpretation. It almost felt like, yeah, I was playing like her perfume, not necessarily her. It was Sophia's version, which I think is so cool and people really appreciate now. And it's nice to see her influences now being made into other movies and shows and things like that. I'm very director driven, so like if Lars von Trier calls you to, to well, hmm, sometimes you gotta be careful about that. Actually, never mind. <laughs> Bad example. <laughs> you definitely gotta read that one first. <laughs> it's mostly about the director and not necessarily about the role for me, but Paul Thomas Anderson suggested me for Melancholia to Lars. So, yeah, that was a no brainer. I had such a good time. It's interesting having such a good time when you're playing someone so depressed, but I felt like it was you don't really get to see. Depression's kind of hard to be portrayed on screen. And Lars did such a beautiful job of portraying like how hard it is to take a shower when you're depressed or how hard it is to eat something or, you know, and he turned it into like a really beautiful, <laughs> intense movie that I feel like will be one of the more special things I, I'll have done. Hon, listen to me. I ran over him. Hit and run. And, and then you stabbed him with a gardening tool. The cops, do you think they're gonna believe us? I don't know, but, but, but people are gonna look for him. But, but look, look I, I was careful. I, I drove the back way all the way home. You, you drove the, a, a man's dead. This is the first TV I'd done in a long time and now TV's amazing. I think they gave me like two or three episodes to read and I just knew like, oh wow, this woman is gonna go through some crazy things. Do you think, uh, I, I know there's a lot of questions, but I just, I got a, um, I got this seminar tomorrow, Life Spring, and I, I gotta drive up to Sioux Falls first thing, so. Um. I work really intensely with someone um, on all my roles, and we do a lot of dream work, so whatever my unconscious kind of gives me, I incorporate into the role that I'm playing. Actually, my dream gave me something funny for Peggy that um, I remember in my dream, there was a tape and it said Scooby-Doo on it. And I was talking to my acting lady and she's like, well, what do you think about when you think about Scooby-Doo? I was like, well, they all like scurry around kind of funny, right? They're always like, la, la, la. like, like a, they have a funny run or like a funny walk. And, and she's like, there you go. So like Peggy had this like funny little walk. I, I got five deaths since Saturday, including the one tonight in the burned down butcher shop and your husband is currently in jail, so I wouldn't count on getting there early. There was definitely something written about Peggy avoiding and like cleaning up and doing kitchen things instead because obviously she's guilty. So in her Peggy-esque way, she just was busying herself. I like that combo of, you know, dark comedy and, and Ted's such a great actor to work with and so sweet. He should run for president, really. These are modern times, you know, and a woman, well, she just doesn't have to be a wife and a mother no more. She can be, there's nothing she can't be. You're a little touched, aren't you? What? He's just a man. Only another man. Jane Campion's always been one of my favorite directors. I would play any role for her. Her female leads and their performances have always inspired me as an actress. I just like take her in sometimes because I'm getting to, you know, have this experience with a, a legend. There's something in acting you always chase, a feeling of like, that you're like flying in a scene. There's no cameras and it feels so free. And I've definitely felt that with certain actors, like Jesse Plemons, for instance. You are marvelous, Rose. Where you're just like on the same page and it's just like trying things and it feels so alive. And I think that's what we all kind of aspire to feel in scenes that you don't, you don't always get it. Peter! 
Rose is really not a fun person to play. She is just, you just have to like go to like all the old pain of like feeling insecure, feeling bad about yourself, and just like let it etch away at your brain. And allowing that to happen to yourself is just a very painful place to work in. And yeah, I just had to like dig up some old things and. <laughs> Benedict and I didn't talk to each other on set, but to be honest, we weren't really in the scenes together. We rarely interacted. So for me, it was just like, oh, just seeing him across the like plains of Montana in the distance would get to my brain. Which is exactly what's amazing about it, is like someone can just, their presence can affect you. You kind of have to manage your career and keep working with like interesting filmmakers or just like working with the people who allow you to express yourself in like the deepest way. I'm in a lucky position. I've been doing this so long. I can wait and pick and choose projects that I really, that mean something to me.